Michael Jackson was once a suspect in the mystery of the Second Zone's composer, due to Sirocco Jones production credits listing music for levels 2 and 3 called The Water. But by the late 2010s, the King of Pop was ruled out, and the prototype tracks provided the context that Hydrocity's composition is in fact the thematic center of the soundtrack, sharing musical threads in common with many other zones. The glissando sliding down the keyboard added a stylish touch to Chrome Gadget and Lava Reef. And in Hydrocity, it's the first thing you hear while free falling into the series' first great water stage. This glissando kicks off Hydrocity's first melodic sequence, featuring the kind of antecedent consequent phrase that we saw at Collision Chaos. First unresolved, then conclusive. Like that track, holding the one chord for the whole section can definitely work, especially if your melody statements evolve in relation to the chord tones of 1, 3, and 5. Both phrases are made of the same main melody, but the first phrase feels inconclusive, because it ends on a note that isn't featured in the tonic triad, the 6, and the Dorian 6 no less. The next run through doesn't conclude on the 1, but lands on the next most stable options, the tonic chords 5 and 3. But by Act 2, Sonic knows his way around the sewers, with the consequent phrase wrapping up with a 5 to the ultimate tonic of 1. And that Dorian tweak is a great way to make an unresolved moment even more foreign without needing to commit to the Dorian mode for the entire track, cause we'll see plenty of the natural minor 6 and droves later on. For now, the bass hangs out in this Dorian stasis for the entirety of section A. Which is the same tack Death Egg takes at the end of the game. And Hydro City uses this Dorian motion to octave hop up to the 1, which pops with the sudden gulp of inhaling an air bubble. And Sonic just misses the next bubble, with the second drastic jump getting demoted to the 7. Close call. Sonic 3 reinvented the water level with speed and open air, but the way to Act 1's upper path is by hitting this backward spring, which newer players tend to jump over, meaning they'll spend plenty of Act 1 underwater. The track's mid-tempo swing rhythm matches the slowed down leaps and bounds of underwater platforming, alongside swung low-gravity classics like the Police's song Walkin' on the Moon. Giant steps are what you take Walking on the moon We could be together Knuckles' stunt has dropped you disoriented in the water, so the one chord is held for all of section A, not really changing chords or hinting where we're headed. Like when your friend pushes you into the drink, for a couple moments you're not sure what happened or which way is up. But some clear chord progressions take form, as you gradually find your sea legs. The chord's root notes only ever descend below the tonic home bass note of 1, never climbing above, with an effect that treats the 1 as the water's surface. So after floundering in the sewers in the first portion, section B brings in chords 6 and 7, while you gradually attempt to make your way up and out the water. But this section ends with an uh-oh energy, because your water tribulations aren't done yet. In the final section, we're finally making real progress up toward the surface, with an even more blatant climb up of chords 4, 5, 6, 7. But the Andalusian cadence from Ice Cap pulls us back down, cause this H2O is not frozen yet. But we're gonna get up and out this water. The final run-through funnels all the water into a powerful sus4 chord. To sussify a major chord, you just move the 3 up to the 4 and play the rest as is. 
moving between the unresolved 4 and the stable 3 creates a satisfying ornamental touch as seen in the first competition stage. But you can add this sus4 power up to any triad, and it's especially powerful on the 5 chord, which is of course the heaviest hitter in terms of generating motion back to the 1 chord. You don't see this 5 to 1 in Labyrinth and Tidal Tempest, levels that lack the open space and speed to justify it. But when you give a 5 chord a sus4, that note is actually the 1 of the entire song's scale. So it's a cool way to tease a preview of the destination, priming the pump for an impactful delivery of the one chord at the song's loop. Which is even more explosive in the finale of Act 2. Oh boy, Act 2! It is immediately after the Act 1 boss that your troubles begin again. The current pulls you down with these descending drum fills and the swirl of bubbles. The tempo rises 27%, the most dramatic Act 2 tempo increase of the game. This adds to the urgency of the advancing wall sequence. And like Cyber said about Death Egg, for the rest of Hydro City, this breakneck pace zips along with Sonic's new confidence, as he soaks in the new normal of a water level that's, you know, actually good. And the bass provides such a funky foundation underneath that Sonic can walk on water like the best of them including the stylish use of ghost notes within a slap bass style. Typically on stringed instruments, you apply pressure with your finger on the fretboard, and the span of string you allow to vibrate is what determines how high or low the note is. But now if you ease up the finger pressure but still maintain contact, the string can't freely vibrate, so it won't have a pitch or note, but it will still provide a kind of thump, a percussive rhythm sound of sorts. These are notated with an X as a note head, and here's the ghost notes at work in the Act 2 arrangement's bass line. And this zone is more a ghost town than a city, because all the echidnas died. Except Knuckles. So all that remains of this civilization is a watery state of mind, where wild velocities are always on offer. And Ullalilia's got the question on everyone's mind. Now you want to see some super speed? Yep, he's maxed. This is nuts. You thought the Act 1 glissandos were cool, but this second act is so stylized that Section A has a glissando after every melodic breath. And in Carpathia's Piano Reel video, these glissandos light the place on fire. You can also see these glissandos in action in his oscilloscope video. As the frequency decreases, so does the pitch of the note, so you can see the waves physically widening during the slide down. This song is just having a whole lot of fun, and its samba grooves help kick off the party with a heaping helping of the partido alto rhythm. This is another example of an asymmetrical rhythm pattern, like the clave seen at Quartz Quadrant. What partido alto has is four notes on the downbeats, with three syncopated notes in the in-between slots between beats. Here's how Hydrocity kicks this rhythm into action. Meanwhile, the drums provide a steady symmetrical beat that helps stabilize the song, allowing for this asymmetrical exploration without unraveling the entire track. The pitch of these partido altos actually gets some cool sus4 action, even touching upon the minor third before settling on the major three. Section A of this partido alto wraps up with a conclusive pentatonic walkdown, a through line found all over the Sonic CD soundtrack. 
And even though it ends definitively on the 1, this stable resolution is short-lived, with a 5 chord pushing you to section B. See if you can detect how this clip is altered compared to the original. Perhaps that just sounded regular to you, but the actual song executes a syncopated pull just 1 16th note earlier, as if the undertow is abruptly yanking you into its strong current. And section B continues the party, this time referencing a rhythmic shape closer to the clave. As you can tell, this track is densely layered, with background melodies that may go unnoticed through hundreds of playthroughs. As rockin' as section C is, this tuba section plays like a lament of an echidna species worried for their future, holding out hope for a savior that may or may not arrive in time. And if the composer wasn't part of the Jackson Squad, we can regard one strong possibility of the Act 2 arranger to be Masaru Setsumaru, or Setsu as he's known in the break room. Setsu was described by Sonic & Knuckles composer Howard Drossen as the genius behind the sonic sound, creating many of its sound effects and said to be responsible for the game's Act 2 remixes, which could involve arranging, programming, or both. If he was the arranger, he'd have been the one responsible for implementing the heavy influence of Tropicalia throughout, in Angel Island, Hydrocity, and the proto-tracks for Carnival Night and Launch Base, all of which furthers the premise that, from the beginning, Sonic 3 was always supposed to be an island game. Sure, Sonic 1 and 2 both took place on islands, but the fact of their island ship was not a prominent factor in the lore. It seemed more just a choice to limit the amount of world building required outside of the zones you run through. Yeah, it's just water out there. But Sonic 3 calls attention to the floating island through its plot and art design, with the fate and altitude of this landmass hanging in the balance. This would explain why every level's title card features a palm tree, even for a frozen zone like Ice Gap. It's all one big island party, baby. But Sonic 3's island vibe is not the only common thread that unites the soundtrack's many levels. There's a few recurring melodic and rhythmic fragments with tendrils reaching across multiple zones, and Hydrocity is perhaps the biggest source hub of these connections. Because how many times have we seen the very end of a measure get jam-packed with 8 16th notes, but then remove the very first one for a silence on that spot on the strong beat? And with more than one parallel to Flying Battery, the zone that was supposed to be ordered after Carnival Night, and was even listed on Happy Meal bags at McDonald's to promote standalone Sonic 3, long before Sonic & Knuckles' existence was even known to the public. Remember how the battery was composed in a minor key, but used that major 7th for some forceful momentum about 3 quarters into the end of the phrase? Cause you know Hydro City's gonna get in on that too. There's another common thread, even in these particular excerpts. See how Flying Battery has plenty of quick 8th and 16th notes, but rounds it all out with just 4 steady quarter notes? Hydrocity Act 1 features the exact same thing, so whoever composed this, we're on to you and it's awesome. This legacy of water resurfaced in Sonic Mania's Hydro City Zone, a stage that takes the original's high-speed aquatics and devolves it back to the labyrinth experience of headaches and seasickness, long sections of slow underwater physics, the 8-bit hell of bubble mechanics, and you finally make it to the surface to just wait around on boats. Leaning on orchestra hits does little to alleviate the pain, and even Nostradamus couldn't predict that this title card would be the one to make you go, ah, yeah, okay, I think I've had enough of this game for today. So although this iteration has forgotten the face of its father, the Sega game Rystar includes a loving homage. Built on the Sonic engine, this game helped earn the devs a subsequent promotion to Sonic Team status. And wouldn't you know it, the second level is water-themed, with a composition by Tomoko Sasaki, the spouse of Sonic CD composer Hataya. 
Remember that stylish pentatonic walk down that wrapped up section A in a neat little bow? Rystar's homage has a quick walk down that's nearly identical, but resolving on that minor to major three maneuver. And Hydrocity's cultural presence also extends beyond video games. To get the word out for Sonic 3's release, Sega partnered with the musical group Right Said Fred, famous for their song I'm Too Sexy For My Shirt, which I heard on the radio a lot as a kid in the 90s. For this Sonic promotion, they changed the lyrics of their song Wonder Man to be about Sonic, with his sneakers and attitude and a new nickname. The music video intersperses in-game footage and has the band in a real-life hydrosity zone, among its hydraulic pumps and sewer tubes. There he is, having a blast. There he is, Speedy Gonzalez. Add to and power sneaker to beat that good just ain't that easy. Wonder Man, he is a little wonder man. A little wonder man, a wonder man. This water network provides H2O to the city above, which became the ruins at Marble Garden, with the edit in this video also suggesting that the launch base Robotnik built now draws water from this same hub. And even that's just a minor project compared to the sprawling amusement park Eggman constructed in the time since the Death Egg crash landed on Angel Island after the events of Sonic 2's final boss. This lore and the soundtrack it's set to is a peerless accomplishment. We may not know exactly who composed what, but there's a silver lining to de-emphasizing the person behind the composition. When I rock out to the music in Marble Garden, I'm connecting with the music as a direct expression of the level's environment, not interpreting it as a personal expression within the context of Miyoko Takaoka's discography. And if we thought Hydrocity might have been a Jackson track, it's because a Sega composer achieved the incredible feat of selling the listener on the Jackson sound. At the time a game is released or a book is published, the creator has taken their turn. All that's left is the art itself. From then on, it belongs to the Sonic community. The experience lives primarily in the imagination of the people who play it through their reactions, interpretations, and sharing battle stories on the playground. That way, when you're in the zone for some hedgehog action, only the essential is present. You, Sonic, Momentum, and the water.